Hi, welcome to the Myrna Loy. <laughs> I'm Chris Holmes, your friendly neighborhood executive director, and we're so happy to have you here and also a live streaming audience. So welcome to everyone who is uh, visiting here in whatever format. We are really excited to host this conversation today. And I want to tell you a little bit about how it's going to work. We are going to have um, a little bit of a discussion and back and forth with Eden and Kev and followed by questions from the audience and questions that come across from the live feed. Afterwards, we are going to ask you to um, flow out into the lobby and enjoy some of our desserts celebrating Myrna Loy's birthday. And then at seven o'clock, we will show the film Tu Wong Fu, which if you would like to come, you can get tickets at the box office to um, attend that. It's going to be really fun. The whole theater will be filled with people uh, laughing and, and enjoying that film. We believe that all art is meant to be enjoyed in community, especially movies. Tomorrow night we have a reception, artist reception in our gallery at 5.30 for the Pride exhibit in the gallery, so please come back to that. We have a beautiful bluegrass concert with Natalie Padilla and the Growling Old Men, two bluegrass masters of Montana, and Natalie is a two-time fiddle champion, national fiddle champion. That's at 7.30, followed by, get this, at the end of our concert, you can walk down to the library lawn and they're going to show, uh, what is the show they're going to show? Too Hot to Handle. What is the Marilyn Monroe movie? Some Like It Hot. Some Like It Hot. They're going to show that on the library lawn at dark right after our concert. So everybody go down to that as well. For this wonderful conversation today, I have to thank Eden Atwood and Kev Ham for putting this together. They dreamed it up right here in the lobby after we all watched a movie a few weeks ago, and they spontaneously have offered to carry on this conversation to help us get a deeper understanding of human life in all of its various wonders. Thank you for joining us, and Eden Atwood and Kev Ham. The Intersex Song. I, 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 is for intersex. N, O, smells, no, it's not the same as trans. Not that there's anything wrong with that. T is for trauma that occurs when consent is withheld and you lie to your patients and scare their parents into making irreversible decisions out of fear and ignorance. E is for Eden Edward, I'm your host for the evening. Are you ready to talk about potentially embarrassing things like S, E, X, which is distinct from gender and both exist on a non-binary spectrum? E is for everybody, everybody is beautiful. Homophobia, misogyny, the patriarchy, white supremacy are all blights. Intersex is sexy, and talking about it is like naked hand gliding while on fire. But you folks are lovely, and I'm happy to be here with you. Any questions?
Hi, everyone. So I have the honor of sitting up here instead of sitting out there, but I want you to know I know distinctly less than most of you. Uh, the only reason I'm here is because Eden texted me yesterday and she was like, so um, my body is now telling me I'm terrified and I have a battle axe and I'm not sure who I need to mow down. <laughs> and unfortunately, the governor wasn't in town, so I had to talk her off the ledge. So did you turn on your mic? I did. Okay. Hello. Thank you for coming. I love the song. Thanks. I don't know all the words. Um, but I especially love the sentiment of it, which is basically that nobody knows all the words to everybody's different gender songs. And then there are intersex songs that none of us have heard before. Welcome, Eden Atwood. Written two days ago. I know. I think right. that was great. Also, I didn't know you played the ukulele. Well, how <laughs> could you not put that? Don't you follow me? I do follow you, but I didn't know you played the ukulele. Most of the times you're playing the piano or the guitar. That's a ukulele. <sighs> That's There's your trouble. See, I'm not a musician. I just sing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what do you want to start with? Uh, do you want to start with your story? Oh, trauma. <laughs> so, Trump was elected president in 2016. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty traumatizing. Um, <clears throat> welcome to therapy. So, when did you find out you were intersex? Okay. Uh, so, the story was I was I was growing up in Butte. I'm not. I don't carry the mark. I wasn't born there. I was born in Memphis. But, um, and I've grown to love Butte since I left. Um, um, it, it's what it takes um, for me. So uh, I was six feet tall, nearly in the sixth grade, and got to be about 14, and I was the last one of my girlfriends. Uh, nobody, everybody had had their period, uh, but not me. And I just watched the other day, I, I watched uh, the Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. And I read the book in a, long before that was a, sort of a, a subject of, you know, there's this intense focus on like, did you get your period? Did you get your period? Who got their period? Lying about having gotten your period, carrying tampons, but you really done, haven't had your period. There's a real, that's a, a huge piece and the praying for it, like, God, please, like, is this happening? Is this going to happen? Is this gonna be, am I normal? Am I normal? Am I normal? Uh, and I wasn't. And that, I didn't have the end of that movie. I had nothing. And I was so panicked. And I remember just begging my mother because I had heard Somehow that, you know, like girls who start late can go to their pediatrician and get a like a huge shot of estrogen and that'll start your period. And so we did that uh, after a lot of begging. Uh, oh, your Aunt Alva didn't have her period until she was 19. I'm pretty sure my Aunt Alva had androgen and sensitivity syndrome and that was her cover story. But that's uh, I'll tell you about that later. So we went and nothing happened. And so we go back and they decide they're going to, you know, do some blood tests. And the blood test came back and that was the last time I was ever invited into the office with my provider and my mother. They met and I stayed in the waiting room. And then the next thing I knew, it was going to be a spring break and I was going to be flown out to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota with my mother. And... I, she couldn't look at me. Um, prior to going, she sat me down and she said, well, Eden, it doesn't appear that you're going to be pushing out any babies. Um, and I was devastated. Uh, it, was, it was heartbreaking and it was confusing and I, and but I didn't even know what questions to ask. I didn't know why or, or anything. So we did go out to Rochester and uh, then it was sprung on me that, you know, I would have to have a surgery because I had twisted cancerous ovaries, which was not true. That was the story that was created by the doctors. That was actually in medical textbooks saying that people with androgen and sensitivity syndrome, which was previously called testicular feminization, which was previously called male pseudo-hermaphroditism, um, 
it's of no benefit to the patient to know the true nature of their diagnosis. So they convinced at the Mayo freaking clinic, right? I convinced my mother, my father never came up. I never had a conversation with my father about it. And then he died when I was 19. We never talked about it. Uh, but they came up with this story and they told my mother the danger is she could be so traumatized by this and it's so rare that she, she might kill herself. So I forgive my mother for that. I'm sure she was scared and she went to the best place she could think of and that's the advice that she got. And so they told me that I had precancerous ovaries. Uh, and I would have to be on hormone replacement for the rest of my life, and but but that's it. And they thought I'd never ask any questions or or find that odd. But the truth has a funny way of coming out, right? So after that, there's a huge disruption in my relationship with my mother. She's got a huge secret from me. Um, I know something's going on. I'm raging and now I've got hormone fluctuations and because I don't want to take the pills. And she's like, did you take your pill? Did you take your pill? Did you take your pill? And I'm like cheeking them and spitting them out just, you know, to be rebellious or whatever, because I don't even know why I'm taking these freaking pills. So I won't get osteoporosis. I'm 15. So that didn't make any sense. So at one point, it got so bad in our relationship, it was so fraught now, that uh, I bought a bus ticket from Butte to go to Lumberton, Mississippi, by I'm myself. Sorry. Lumberton? <laughs> yes. Did you throw a dart at a map? That's where my father was. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Dry County in Lamar County, Dry County in Mississippi, that's where my dad's people were from, and that's where he was. So I was going to leave. And I got on the bus. I put the bus ticket under my own name uh, because I wasn't thinking. Though I told everybody on the bus my name was Ashley. <laughs> and I remember at one point, you know, cops came on, flashlights shining. I was like, oh, I'm screwed. And then they just got off, and that was it. And I made it all the way to Lumberton. I found out later that, you know, my mother knew that I was on that bus and they said do you want us to haul her back and she said no just let her go to her dad's so i showed up at my dad's my dad was divorcing his fifth wife not his last wife uh, and she had come down and there was a, a lot of contention between them and so she got me high and drunk one night and we were smoking cigarettes and now i'm like almost 16 and she conspiratorially told me you know, your parents lied to you. You're really half man, half woman. And that was the first time I thought about killing myself. Wow. There's the trauma. <clears throat> yeah, so obviously just the easiest life ever. And so as you found out about this, you obviously had to deal with the trauma. You're 16 years old. When did you find out the medical truth about it, not the conspiratorial truth from the soon-to-be ex-wife? Well, strangely, this was still when you could call like area code for Rochester, Minnesota, and then 555-1212. And I knew my endocrinologist, my pediatric endocrinologist's name. And I got his home phone number because I'm 54. And this was a long time ago. I'm talking like for almost... the young people in the audience, a landline is... <laughs> And you go like this with the numbers. Yeah, this is a rotary dial. So I, you know, I'm, I'm drunk, high, and hysterical, screaming that I'm going to sue him, and that he had no right to lie to me. And the, the next thing I knew, I was flown back up to the Mayo Clinic. My father never discussed this with me. My mother met me there. And then... They, now it was like, okay, so here's, here's the truth. In, in fetal development, sex uh, differentiation happens at about this time, and you've got undifferentiated gonads that, based on the chromosomes and then Mullerian duct regression factor and blah, 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 uh, defect defect on the X strand of maternally passed strand of DNA. 
uh, renders the fetus unable to respond to androgens. And as she, all human life starts out inherently female, uh, this is how you were born. Uh, not twisted cancerous ovaries, internal testes, no uterus, no fallopian tubes, no cervix, everything else phenotypically the way I looked when I was a baby and, and forevermore uh, female. But internally and chromosomally, genetically speaking, typically male chromosomes. And there's all kinds. So the, the, the definition of intersex, right, is where a person is born, a person, uh, with a either genital anatomy, reproductive anatomy, a chromosomal pattern that doesn't seem to fit the typical notions of male and female. Inter meaning between. That's intersex. That is a clunky definition that's hard to uh, get people to... Uh, what? What is that? What do you mean? Like, do you have both? No, because that's a myth, and that doesn't actually happen. Um, because the clitoris and the penis, gestationally speaking, are the same organ. It goes one direction or the other. Scrotum and labia, same gestational organ, goes one direction or the other. Or in the case of intersex people, um, I had complete uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome, complete. Um, which meant that I looked entirely phenotypically female. They didn't see anything. But people with partial androgen insensitivity syndrome can have ambiguous looking genitals that don't confirm them one way or the other. Here's what's really fucked up. They, the practice has been to, out of pure social panic and for no medical reason, to surgerize intersex babies and quote unquote, normalize their genitals for social reasons only, leading to all kinds of things like scarring, loss of sensation, pain uh, during uh, arousal, no arousal, all kinds of things. And these Osteoporosis. Are <laughs> That's when you take the hormone producing organs that are, are f fine. Like, are we taking the breasts off of every, you know, prepubescent girl with the BRCA gene? No, but they could have mine. <clears throat> so, so they told me all this, but what, what difference does it make? Now it's already been done. You can't undo it. Like you already made me feel like I'm a freak. You already thought that what, what, how my body was, was so terrible, so awful, so abhorrent that I could never know. And so this is also before the internet. Imagine that. So for the next 13 years, I, I buried it. I didn't want to tell anybody about this. This was horrifying. And we never spoke about it again. I was on a soap opera, and there was some rumor going around that Eileen Davidson on a different soap opera, because she had a strong jaw, was actually a man. I was like, well, that's bullshit. But if they find out about me. So I didn't stay on the soap opera for very long. I went into the money-making career of jazz singing, <laughs> where the fame would be so, right. Uh, that was a, you know, it was more me, but it was also a place to hide. Like, it was so uh, terrifying. It was terrifying. So then I went to Japan on a tour. And, the internet had just happened and it was explained to me like, oh no, this is Alta Vista search engine and you can like look up information. I thought, what am I, a fucking librarian? Like, I, you know, I could care less. I don't want information. But I was in the Hotel Osaka with some time to kill and there was a business center and they had these computers and I was, so I called my mother and probably cost like 20 bucks to call her. I'm like, what do I have again? Yeah, well, they're calling it androgen insensitivity now. Okay, thanks, bye typed it in, and a hit with a name. Patricia in Canada. And I just flipped out and didn't call her until I got back to the States. Uh, but when I did call her, we talked for six hours. 
And she told me the same story. She told me my story. And then she told me that that happened to her niece and her other niece, because it can run through maternal family lines. A natural variation, not a defect. A variation. That the, I'd never ever meet anybody like me was, was not true. It's as common as naturally occurring red hair. One to two percent of the global population. It's a variation of sex development. It's a it's a a human. And there are about 30 or 40 um, sort of known codified intersex variations. A few have some other medical uh, pieces to it. There can be a salt wasting component in congenital, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That requires medical intervention. This whole like elevated risk, like if, if you have internal testes, that's like they're, what they're using is science for typical XY men with an undescended testy. That's not the same thing. And it's still like a very small percentage. What about monitoring? But that's not where we were. Is it where we are? No, it's also not where we are. So we this this happened because uh, a documentary on focus features was just shown here at the Myrna Loy, and it's called Everybody, and it featured three intersex people, um, one of whom is a dear friend, uh, Sean Saifa Wall, and an incredible activist, and another woman, Alicia, who has a, a intersex story similar to mine, and uh, an intersex trans person, non-binary person, uh, River Gallo, who's also a film director. And um, so they went through and told their stories. It was a big damn deal. I'm in Helena, Montana. Like this is, I'm like 90 miles from Butte, that, where it all like went down. And I'm gonna go see a movie that features a friend of mine in Helena about intersex stuff. It, it was a surreal experience. Uh, after I had reached out to Patricia, then there was a, 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 a support group meeting. The intersex movement is about 30 years old. That's it. It started because there was a, a bad man uh, named Dr. John Money who worked at Hopkins. And he had a whole like nature over uh, nurture versus nature argument, and but he didn't have a test subject until this set of Canadian twin boys, one of whom had his penis excised in a terrible laser circumcision accident, and this family was wrecked, and John Money found out about them, and said, "I've got the solution for you." If you can get a child before the age of two, you can assign the gender, reinforce it, and nurture will take over. And so that's what they did to David Reimers. They, they cut off the rest of his genitals, fashioned a vagina. They changed the name and moved and then John Money published over and over and over the success of this. But this kid was suicidal and miserable. And finally, in junior high, the parents broke down and told this kid what had happened, Brenda at the time. And David immediately transitioned, wound up you know, getting older, getting married, ha had stepchildren, found out that John Money was using this, this, all of these published reports to codify and medicalize an approach to dealing with intersex children. That's where it all started. And so David Reimer started speaking out and doing interviews, but uh, in, in a, the most horrifying thing, and they don't talk about this in the movie, but the most horrifying thing about it for me, and I'm a therapist, uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and uh, the twin brother who was not cut into was the first to kill himself. 
And then David followed suit. The secondary trauma, of the, it exploded this family. But these surgeries still happen. The social panic is still, uh, there, there is a rush. Things like what just happened in the legislature make pave the way for intersex surgeries to still occur trying to define biological sex, uh, for instance, and then putting in some bullshit caveat about like, but if you were like born, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is, it's so dangerous. I haven't done this in a room full of mixed company, strangers and friends. Uh, oh, they're mixed differently. There's <laughs> nuts and happy people and... Almond Joy. Uh, exactly. But I, I have done interviews. I have written about it. I, uh, but I have never done this. And uh, it is, I was, I started to sort of freak out about it. I mean, the trauma that lives in my body is profound and it happens and it, it, I can't, really do anything about it. I can try to do all the things I would tell my patients to do, like practice mindfulness, and things like that. <laughs> practice mindfulness. Could you roll a mindful joint? Right. I'm um, having a mindful cocktail. One of the things that I find very interesting about the whole intersex discussion is that from 1905 until 1988, 89, 90, the vagina and the associated organs with it were not in Grey's Anatomy, the book. Right. Uh, so you have a bunch of science that we still rely on to this day that is taught by or written by and then taught by people who are basically the fifth monkey in a room uh, that didn't have the anatomy book to explain it. And so you end up with a situation where doctors, who we all know are infallible and never make mistakes, uh, <laughs> literally don't even have the tools to discuss this and are told to make a decision and in our society with the way we train doctors they end up being the voice of reason and compassion also a lie uh and so in watching the documentary it was very interesting to see these people that were you watch this doctor dr money as he was talking and everything he said he said with the voice of command which was very sort of i know what i'm doing and these are the truths that you must follow and if you really, if you just typed out the words and read them, you'd be like, what crack are you smoking? Because it made no sense whatsoever. And it's amazing what doctors are able to get away with it just simply because of the way they're trained to react to it. So your mother had probably stood no chance, and, honestly. And really, I do have compassion for her. Uh, I, I don't have the belief that somehow I, if I had been in her situation, I would have done something different. In one shuffling of the deck, you're the oppressed, and in another shuffling, you're the oppressor. I didn't want I didn't want to get my son circumcised, but he, this was an adoption, and there was pressure, and I didn't know that I could. I was scared, and that was a that was a key moment of understanding uh, with my mother that I I could forgive her. I once said to her. I once said to her, it was a, a difficult relationship uh, in so many ways, but I once said to her, like, you left me there. You, you left me in the desert for 13 years. You never said anything. And she said, I was in the desert too. It was just a different desert. And I know that's true. I know that's true. So, okay, we were sitting in the audience, and I'm sitting two chairs over because I don't like sharing an armrest. And Eden, at the end of the movie, goes, we should do a talk at Pride. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm happy to. That was after my... you told me I wasn't allowed to cry. Oh, no, you can cry anytime. <laughs> Tear ducks are my friends. Anyway, I, in my head, went, this will be amazing. And then 10 minutes later, I went, I'm going to have to be on stage with her because I don't think she's ever done this. And in talking about this, I realized that nobody does this. Nobody talks about being intersex. Like, have you heard of an intersex talk before? How many before, like three years ago, had heard the term intersex and anything other than somebody explaining what the 204 letters in the LGBTQIA blah, 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 blah was? 
So a few of you. But how many really knew what it meant? Because I knew it was in there as intersex. But if somebody asked me, one, I couldn't point out the flag. We have 705 of them. And two... It's the uh, circle. It is the circle. I do know that now. Um, but I couldn't define it. I don't. I didn't know anyone was intersex, or at least I thought I didn't. That was the great one. So I didn't know anybody that was intersex, and I was chatting about something online, and all of a sudden, Eden's like, you know I'm intersex, right? I'm like, no. I thought you were a jazz musician. It's one or the other. I mean, there are direct lines to what you can be. <laughs> And either you have the ability to count in 5-4 or you're intersex. That's true. That's true. Which means I think actually you're the jazz musician and I'm intersex because <laughs> I can't count for shit. Uh, but it was it was one of those eye-opening eye -opening moments where I, I went, okay. And then in my own head, I'm like, can I ask questions? Like, should I ask questions? Should I be? And I'm like, I'm just going to be supportive because that's one of the things that I have learned uh, when being a part of the queer community but also not being all parts of the queer community. There are parts of the queer community that I don't understand. And I'm saying this for those of you that are out there that are not part of the queer community and are probably going, I don't even know what the second letter is. It's fine. <sighs> what is it? The third letter is by. We just erase them. It's fine. <clears throat> we love them. I'm kidding. Uh, you don't have to understand. You don't have to have a deep clear understanding of all the parts of somebody's life in order to let them be valid in your own mind that that's who they are and they are perfect people. And that's the lesson that I think we all need to learn in so many ways as we have all the pieces come out. You know, in Pride Week, it's later this year. Uh, we have more people involved with all of it, which is very surprising. But we also have a lot of people that keep coming up to me, and they're like, hey, I need to know about this thing. And I, I don't have the answers. And I love that you wanted to come up here and give this talk and, and have this moment where people could come up and ask questions, because there are so many questions out there, and none of them are appropriate. Uh, welcome to an intersex discussion. By the way, let's figure out a vagina. Not a sentence I ever thought I would say. Uh, but then intersex goes both ways. It has all sorts of different things in it. It has all these different... They said in the movie there were like 46 different known variations of intersex. And I'm like, that's amazing. And think of all of the things that the doctors have screwed up. If there's 46 different variations, 1.2% of the population, we have 300 million, or 350 million people in the United States... So you're talking 300,000 people, 46 different variations. That's, you know, maybe, maybe 50,000 people with the different piece or, or 5,000 people with the different piece, different variation. And the doctors are supposed to know all this, but they're trained to, we have to know it all. And I shall forever be the do, 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 make a decision. Uh, that's got to be overwhelming for them too. Are I they getting better? You know, some... You find your people that will listen to you that I, you know, one of my top things is like, if I don't, if I can't have somebody that's queer, like I, I can't go to a therapist that's not queer. I, I can't explain queer culture to somebody who, so that's not going to work. Um, I'll go see a doctor that's not queer. I prefer to see a woman if I can. And, and I need somebody that, that will, you know, proclaim from the jump that they are trauma informed. I want a collaborator. I don't need an educator. I, I need a collaborator. Oftentimes, I'm I know more than than my providers, and that's I, I, that's okay with me, so long as it doesn't turn into like a power struggle or like I'm the keeper of the. Um, you that think I don't you know for. everything, but I have keys. So you know that 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 I'm not. So you find people um, that are that will collaborate with you and that are respectful and trauma informed, and uh, it is stunning that there are situations. I speak in an advised way right now to secure my employment. Um, <laughs> that we can't come up with just a statement that says we provide ethical, gender affirming care for anybody, everybody. But that is, no, not in this ever so crimson state um, can we do that. 
where that is not happening right now. So changing from the inside, to my knowledge, I think I'm the only person at, I work at St. Peter's. I think I'm the only person who has their pronouns on all of their business correspondence um, that, that I've seen. And my pronouns are she, they. That feels more true than the years I spent cultivating this hyper, hyper feminine ideal because I was trying to fool somebody or convince somebody, typically anybody the, with the male gaze, that, that I was legitimate. That's how a person winds up married six times. You just keep trying to, like, you're grasping for something like it's going to, there's some validation if you just get the right kind of it. Of course, you figure out when you're, you know, approaching 50 that um, that validation has to uh, be self-generated, that that the flow is off, that you can't get it from the outside in. Um, I hate that because, uh, you know, I've spent so much time trying to get it in, you know, like I really, really worked the femme fatale thing, like the whole fabulous Baker Boys thing. That was my thing. I think we were talking, Chris and I were talking about when it was that I performed here, like maybe approaching 20 years ago. I did a gig here with my band. Um, maybe not quite that long, but uh, that was still, there's been these like steps, these steps toward greater acceptance of myself uh, less hiding, more solidarity, even something approaching pride. Uh, but the only thing that makes any of that, uh, that helps is that it has to have a meaning. There has to, we're meaning making creatures. There has to be a purpose, a meaning. If I can, it's not like I, I want to be thought of as noble, uh, if I could get away with like not having to ever talk about this, absolutely I would. It's not noble. It's survival. It it has to have purpose or it's just too awful to think about young people having their bodies cut into and being lied to about what about their bodies and being saddled with this like this secrecy and the shame that is so painful. It just cores you. And until or unless you can sit in a room with other people and you can tell your story and then there are people that are slow nodding because it happened to them too. That's a huge part of it. That's a huge part of the beginnings of if I can feel compassion for that person who's like me, maybe I can also have some compassion for myself. Any questions? <laughs> These are crazy questions, right? Oh, thank you. Uh, those of you that are online, you can actually type in questions and comments on Facebook and YouTube, and we can see them as well if you have any. Um, I have one. Yeah. When was the first time that you accepted who you were? Well, probably in that room, in that circle of other, you know, women. It was women only. I think this is an important part of the story. You know, at first it was when we when we had a support group in the United States that started to get together. It was only women, only women with with Swires or AIS, maybe Marfons. But there was a lot of fear. Uh, that we would be infiltrated by somebody who wasn't by a man, like a by by a man pretending to be a woman. So you are looking at one of the you know the, the reformed turf because uh, I was so scared. I was so scared uh, when we first started making contact over email. We wouldn't tell each other our real names. I wasn't going to tell anybody my real name. No, none of us did. We were terrified, but then it started to grow. Uh, then family started to come, and then 
one year, you know, this family had been coming for a while and they had this, this sweet daughter, you know, with intersex daughter that we all just loved and, and felt so like, you know, protective of. And then this kid said, except I'm not a girl. I'm a boy. And what were we going to do? Kick him out? Reject him? It was a huge, it was a lightning rod moment of like, oh shit. We've been doing some, we've been doing some bad things to other people. Anybody who wasn't really presenting in a hyper feminine way. We had all of these things that we made you go through. Like you had to have somebody that knew you, that had heard your story, that, that, that it sounded legit to sponsor you to be part of our email circle. I mean, it was very cloak and dagger shit. It was really, um, and so after that, I had, I personally had a lot of apologies to make to people that I had excluded and harmed as a person who felt so excluded and harmed. But that does happen. That does happen. In marginalized and oppressed groups, you have infighting because everybody's trying to survive. So what was your question? Uh, Accepting myself. (laughs) When did you accept yourself? I assume that'll be next Tuesday. Yeah, right. Uh, During the parade. uh, Well, and I remember, you know, growing up gay and growing up in Helena, you know, I wasn't out, but all of my friends knew because I'm subtle as shit. So subtle. <clears throat> and uh, you know when I, you know, I thought I, lo- I thought I hated Helena, just like you hated Butte. Uh, what I hated was who I was in Helena. Mm. And I'm wondering if you know your reconciliation with Butte is the same thing. It's like it's not the town; it's the things that happen to you in it, and all the memories that are tied to it that become the thing that you have to get over. And I remember all of the bullying that I went through because like, you're so girly. I'm like, mm, just because I know how to put on eyeliner better than any of the cheerleaders <laughs> means you're terrible people. So um, <laughs> there's the interesting thing that I, you know, in this discussion with all of it, and I, I deal with the politics and seeing everything and, you know, I'm running for office and all that jazz. There was the bill that, uh, that came out that is banning gender care for minors. And the weird part of that is, is that the carve out in that bill is literally to destroy intersex kids in order to make parents feel better about the child that they've had. And so you have these people who constantly yell that they are all about saving the children who have literally written a bill that will kill children in two different ways. One, it will not allow a child who is trans to get the gender affirming care that they need in order to live. And two, it will allow parents to perform an unnecessary illogical surgery on their child in order to make that child's gender presentation conform to something that the parents are okay with. And that is the sort of insanity that we are fighting every day. And it is just the perfect example of how utterly evil the other side is. And I don't say those words lightly. I don't don't say them in the, oh, he's joking about it. No, I actually think they're evil. They have decided that they are going to ruin, ruin people's lives any way they can if they don't conform to the very narrow definition of what they think people are. And as I look around the room, as I look to my friends and I look at my community and I look at all of the amazing, different, varied, utterly incredible people And I think every single one of us would be removed because these people lack imagination. They see the world in black and white and they are about as exciting as watching paint dry on the moon. So there is a way, I will say this. Uh, Am I a fan of, of the patriarchy? Certainly not. But I have had experiences where uh, as a, in a one-on-one as a therapist, when I have somebody who is extremely conservative in their views when they're in front of me i see scared children i see people who are doubling down 
on something that gives them some sort of false illusion of control. And I can feel compassion for individuals. Now, when we get into like a group think situation, my compassion wanes. Just a little. Just a little. <laughs> but so I, I did, you know, I'm also the parent of a, of a, of a black child and, and my hubris that like, well, I sing jazz, I can raise a black boy which turned out to be just horseshit, right? Like, and all of the, there's so much crossover with the bullshit of adoption, that adoption is so great, right? It's just so great. It's not great. It's maternal separation trauma. It's a billion dollar industry. It harms kids. It doesn't do what it can. It Can it be okay? Yes. Does it get handled right? No. So the, the understanding of like, whoa, like, the coming awake of trying to figure out like how to to be a, a proper parent to this kid when I've participated in something that that has harmed him. He has harm from that. For sure he does. Um, that is a, a there's profound responsibility there. And so I I I have made these mistakes. I've been the, the you know the quote unquote evil person. I, I have to believe in growth. I have to, or I'm not interested in staying. Have to. And I don't want to walk around my life being, so I walked around my life for, you know, when Ben was, you know, growing up in Missoula, you know, old Missoula. Um, and I just freaking hated white people. Just hated them. And I just, oh, I was had my heart broken so many times when somebody who, who said they loved him would endanger him by like, no, he can't go outside and play with a freaking airsoft gun. Wake up. And he's listening to you. You are a person in charge. He believes in you. And you are undercutting me and you are not listening. So... I can't be in that anger all the time. I was, it was killing me. It was killing my body. It was killing my spirit. It was hurting my relationship with my son. And it was depriving me of any opportunity for joy. And God damn it, there will be joy. There will be joy. I like ending on that note because there will be joy. And that's, you know, one of the things that people need to realize. That's why we celebrate pride. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Are there any questions from anybody in the audience? Somebody has one. Yes. Right there in the front. Hi, Tracy. Yeah, no, it's it. I I wish I could tell you that it was like a real decision where I was like social work, but really I just needed a gig, <laughs> and I was getting divorced, and I was like, oh, I'm never gonna, but you know, like I have to cement my financial future myself, and uh, I was teaching music, and one of my students was a professor of social work at Walla Walla. You should go to school. And I was like, you know what? fine. So now I have $65,000 worth of debt. Um, and that's how that worked. But it did help. It did help tremendously uh, because it gave me a, even more framework to understand, you know, uh, being a, a, a social worker as opposed to, you know, the, the, that distinction, there are lots of pathways to becoming a therapist. You go to psychology, you could be licensed professional counselor. The social work one is concerning itself with systems 
and institutions and context. And that's everything. This, that, that context is everything. And that awareness of systems and institutions and how it oppresses certain groups over others uh, gives you a, a, a framework to understand some of the harms that, that, that happen to groups and individuals within those groups. Go ahead. I love you too. How do you help people to navigate the systems and make change within them? I think part of that is letting people know that you are in a system, that there there's so many people that I work with that that have been given this like, oh, America's the best country in the whole world when everybody knows it's Denmark. <laughs> like you're not pulling you. Come on, people. That's well researched. I mean, Bhutan kicks our ass, right? Mali kicks our ass. But but to be like the the national gaslighting that that happens, I mean, like I'm I'm sort of this is my uh I'm the fucked up middle-aged intersex Barbie look. It's just even that. And I'm fat Ken. <laughs> <laughs> and we Sexy love each other platonically very much. Uh, but I think that is, you know, that that is getting so much traction, this movie. Like, yeah. But, you know, traction and that, that for some people, that's the beginning of the conversation. That's not a well they're not well traveled conversation uh, that the the speech where you know the the dilemma of, of what it is just to be a woman in this in this culture that that for that to be spoken in a very clear concise very uh mainstream money making way i mean hell we're still just like on the on the other side of like me too that that the, the the systems and the and the institutions that started with white supremacy, they did. Some people don't want it, want to hear that. They don't like that. I'm sorry. Ron DeSantis, we're sorry that you're a piece of shit. <laughs> but it's true. And those systems and institutions have not changed. And there is no personal change without power, without political change. Otherwise, what happens is individuals wind up feeling like they're fucked up and, and, and that it's their fault, that they're failing at therapy, that, that they're just not trying hard enough, that they're not bootstrapping themselves into a better situation. And it's infuriating. And so I love being able to be like, welcome to the Matrix. <laughs> For those of you at home who don't know, the Matrix is actually a trans allegory. Uh, if you, and this always cracks me up because you have all the people on the right. They're like, "I'm gonna red pill you." Okay, pumpkin. We're gonna have a long <laughs> talk about how you missed the metaphor and got it exactly backwards, or how your name needs to change. I don't care which one, but it's gonna happen. Um, we're coming up on the end of the hour. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes. Sure. Uh, the cultural question. I'm going to repeat it for the people at home. The hydra, you know, the katoi in Thailand, hydra in India, uh, two spirit native indigenous cultures. There were lots of. There, there have been lots of cultures where there has been uh, uh, that that haven't had this intense clamping down. This this is also about like you know, capitalism and a culture that is so based on achievement and accomplishment and getting ahead and keeping up with the Joneses and what is mine and and division in that way. We talk about like it takes a village to, to raise a child. Where is this village? This is like Brigadoon, if, as far as I'm concerned, where it's like but once every hundred years or something. Uh, that is... Uh, 
such a profound uh, piece of the puzzle that that is like, you know, the two fish swimming by and the deer on the bank says, hey, fellas, how's the water? And one fish turns to the other and says, what's water? That's culture. You don't know. You don't know with what you don't know uh, until something happens to you and you feel something and something is something's uh, off or something's wrong or, or you're getting married for the fifth time and you just really can't say anymore that you just haven't met the right guy. I did meet the right guy, but um, that was the sixth <laughs> one. Hi, Brad. Uh, so, yeah, maybe one more question before we have to clear sure. and get ready. Anyone else? Hi there in the back. Fuck those people. Oh, thank oh. you. <laughs> thank you for that. I'm going to repeat it for the people online. That was The question was, can you talk about your relationship to the rest of the queer community? I am the, I am the, the, the leader of the Island of Misfit Toys. And there are other members, but we don't, we're more like an archipelago. So everybody has their own island, and it's off the coast of Queerville. So it you know, like I've got my tattoo and sometimes people see it, you know, but like and I, I don't immediately have entree into community. I have to. Um, and sometimes it's really uh, cringy and awkward when I'm sitting with with, you know, new people or I'm meeting new people like I did recently on the porch of our new neighbors. And there were some very cool people there and I was excited to meet them and a queer couple and you know i just like had to work intersex into the conversation like pretty quick because i'm like please be my friend <laughs> i need queer friends that's like what happened with you know i was just getting so upset and so tight getting ready for this talk but i was you know like making cute songs and like posting about it and you know like being uh you know the, the my best impersonation of normal but I was getting tighter and tighter. And then I started a fight with my husband over the AC and what temperature we could put it on. And I ended with, I don't think we should take vacations together. And then I texted Kev and I said, I think I'm scared. And he said, oh, yeah. honey, of course you are. Why did you think I offered to do this with you? And of course, that's, you know, that's what... As as much as my my heteronormative you know friends uh, who love me and 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 care for me, they they can't understand they can't understand like somebody who's also queer but it's still pretty lonely doesn't have to be when somebody asks you to do something that you don't understand when somebody asks you to take their story of who they are and how they relate to another part of uh, a community that you may not be a part of. That's a gift. Hold it and just let it be. You don't have to do anything else. And there are plenty of times when you will want to do something else. There are many times where I like to play elephant and knock other people out of the room to protect my friends. And sometimes that is not the right thing to do. Sometimes you have to let your friends lead. And just know that most of your friends have purchased a battle axe and they can. So, um, a pride battle axe. Yes. <laughs> uh, I will say this, you know, the, the intersect as we wrap up the intersect uh, story, there are so many narratives uh, recently I did a, um, an interview. It's a two hour interview and it just went live. It's on the outwards, uh, archive, uh, protecting and respecting the narratives of our LGBTQIA plus elders, which I took some umbrage to. <coughs> Don't worry. I'll get you a walker. But they were hard up for the intersex story. So I'm like, I, I like to think that I, you know, I squeaked in, but, uh, that's live on the on the Outwards archive. You can just search my name and you can hear more of that story. There's some there's some interviews and things like that. And if you have specific questions and you want to get in touch or you or or you know, like 
if you have relatives, friends, family, anybody who has children in their lives that, that need support or help or questions answered, uh, I, I am available for all of that to the extent to which I can. I don't have all the answers, but I am uh, generally speaking, know people who do if I don't. And thank you. Thank you for coming and for holding the space for me to do this. I cried much less than I thought I was going to. I think that's a win. <laughs> and um, I just thank you very much. Thank you, Kev. You're welcome. And thank you to Molly. <laughs> really appreciate Molly. That's so nice. That's so nice. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody online, too. Uh, you should bow. I don't it's, know. So nice. it's so nice. Thank you so, so much. Just a reminder that it is Pride Week, and we have events going on every day for the rest of the week through Sunday. You can get a guide out in the lobby, and we do welcome you to come to all of those as well. Tonight, we have the showing of... To Wong Fu, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar here, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, and also we have drag trivia and queer karaoke going on. So whatever you'd like to do tonight, there's definitely some fun to be had. And thanks for coming out and learning a little bit about part of the community we don't often talk about. <laughs>